Thank you very much. Um, and thank you for all of you either coming back or remaining here until the end of a very long day. Um, and I apologize for this title. This was uh, handed to me by Amos. Uh, and he said, wouldn't it be interesting if we had a topic like this? Uh, and it really is an important topic, actually, because so often we don't hear about failed studies. Uh, people try to bury the results or the studies are never published. And some of the uh, messages that have come from these are so important. So I have a disclosure slide somewhere. There it is. Okay. Well, we've all heard about some of the new players and the emerging landscape, and there are lots of different treatments over the course of time. Those that are marketed are shown here in the center, but there are many, many therapies that are all in various phases of study. So the landscape is emerging and growing and becoming much more complex and really is enough to make you a little dizzy, isn't it? We also have learned a lot from some of these studies. So I, I like to do my top 10 list. So here is my top 10 reasons why we have failed studies. Number 10, right idea, wrong disease. And so often we get information from the basic immunology and we think this is going to work in MS. And it turns out it might work really well in something like lupus. Or the other way around, something was tested in lupus and didn't work, so why not try it in MS? All these autoimmune diseases have some kind of commonality behind it. So there might be wrong idea, right idea, wrong disease. What number nine? The mechanism we're studying is relevant to immunology, but may not be relevant to the disease multiple sclerosis. Number eight, it's relevant, but so much goes on that in isolation, it's irrelevant. And there's examples of that, of course. Maybe it's working, but we're just not measuring the right thing. Or we're insensitive to the gains that are made in a very short treatment trial, often less than two years. Unfortunately, this has happened all too often. We get an idea out of animal studies that this might work in humans, and suddenly humans don't quite behave the way the animals do, and we get some unexpected things that the animals never developed, and the agent is shelved. Or the uh, predicted toxicity. So it's not just that the disease got worse when it wasn't supposed to, but it produced an abnormality that was not anticipated maybe in the way of an organ toxicity that uh, had not been seen in animals. Maybe we're giving it the wrong way. Maybe it was set up as an IV and maybe it should be given oral or vice versa. And the route of entry may be very important to the mechanism. A perfect example would be how many people here remember when GA was given orally? Hey, it worked in an uh, uh, injection, and there was all this, and I, I'm not, that's just one of the many studies, but I'm not going to talk about that, so I'm just going to talk about it now. It's one of the many studies that came out of studying so-called oral tolerance, and the idea that you could feed the antigen to animals, and, and uh, of course, uh, do wonders for EAE, uh, but uh, when you gave it to humans, absolutely nothing happened. Uh, there were many attempts at that, not just uh, the oral GA, but even before that, there was something called oral myelin. And they had uh, fed these people these four or five large capsules filled with myelin basic protein that uh, gave people lots of good energy but didn't do anything for their MS. Right drug, maybe the wrong dosage or the wrong frequency. And we've seen evidence that, for instance, in some of the injectables, you can see differences in dosage and frequency. But so often we're pulling up the dosage and the frequency from theoretical uh, animal studies on what might work in humans. And so we go maybe with a, a range of dosing and we decide on something that may be limited by toxicity 
and we're not seeing the benefit to the disease, but maybe if we changed the dosage, went higher, or gave it a different way, we might see something. We're giving it to the wrong patient population. What if you went, everyone went into progressive disease, it didn't see an effect that may actually reduce relapses? Of course you're not going to get the benefit. Or vice versa. Maybe this is something that we're missing out on. A perfect a contemporary example might be liquinamide. Liquinamide had a very modest, if anything, effect at reducing relapses in relapsing remitting disease, but there was something about the way it worked on disease progression. So now, of course, it's being tested in a primary progressive population, and we are awaiting the result. But everybody wants the number one reason. You want to know what it is? MS is not EAE. I've often told my patients, come in with furry ears and a tail, and I will fix you, because we can cure EAE. Almost in every way, and almost anything, can cure EAE given right. All right, well, we need to learn from our mistakes. And to quote a famous author, mistakes are the portals of discovery. So uh, we need to go back to the drawing board in many of these cases. What can we learn from some studies? And there have been numerous fail studies. I just talked about a few, but I've heralded a few of these um, because you may not have heard of them or because I think they really are important points and have contemporary um, uh, implications. Everybody has their version of the busy slide. So here it is. Just what you wanted to see at 6 o'clock in the evening. I borrowed this from my good friend, uh, uh, Jalbert, who, who's uh, published this. But the whole idea is all of these circuitry, these immunological circuits, have been built upon a wealth of scientific papers that have identified various molecules that might be working within the brain at the level of the barrier or externally. And in almost every one of these cases, it gives us a lead. And the lead oftentimes has yielded something in the way of a therapy. Where are we getting all these things from? It's this type of work that yields that type of idea. And the problem is, if we focused in on just one of these, like IL-17, I just threw that up there because it's contemporary. If you do something about IL-17, but all this other stuff is going on, are you going to expect to see a difference in the outcome of the disease if you just focus in on one single molecule? And that's part of the problem. So. We've tried various ways of uh, uh, using that uh, scientific knowledge to develop therapies. And I'll just summarize a few trials and errors with a few of the references to these. So right at the very beginning, the, the whole breakthrough in MS, we can thank AIDS for the development of a lot of the scientific rationale that has grown over the years. The explosion of AIDS around the world forced governments to pour huge amounts of money into understanding the immunology of AIDS, and it gave us the tools to then study autoimmune diseases in ways in which we hadn't done before. And back in the days when we used to simply drip on monoclonal antibodies and look at cells under slides, I remember those days, now we have machines that do it for us, and you can get answers rather quickly. But one of the first monoclonals that were thought of was let's do away with the T cells. All the T cells express CD3, so you come up with a monoclonal antibody that does away with CD3 positive T cells. And uh, the therapy led to some benefit in terms of, well, Brian, you could tell me about this. You were one of the authors of the paper. But the problem was toxicity. And, and hematological and systemic toxicity was so severe that uh, it was not thought of as being able to go forward with further studies. So we focused in on, well, maybe not all CD3 cells we should, we should target. Maybe because all the animal models were telling us it's the CD4 cell that's driving the disease, let's knock out CD4 cells and see what happens. In those days, we called it OKT4. That was the company who made 
the monoclonal antibody. Remember, these were mouse monoclonals at the time. They didn't have chimeric technology uh, in, in, in those years, in the early 90s. So yes, anti-CD4 really did reduce the CD4 populations, but mainly the naive and not the activated cells. And we know it's the activated cells that are probably causing the damage. Hence, we were not seeing benefit. So I think the message here that whole scale depletion of T cell subsets is by themselves not going to do anything. And we've learned a lot since then because not all CD4 cells are bad. And there's a balance between the good guys and the bad guys. And you're really upsetting it all when you knock out just all of one subset or maybe some of that. What about uh, some of the bad uh, so-called immune stimulants, the cytokines? And there's networks that are highly integrated. And you saw that on the slide a couple of slides ago, how intricately involved these are. So here we think about IL-12 and 23P40. These guys are driving the monocytes. These are driving the cells that are, are presenting antigen both inside and outside the brain. We have now a very valuable uh, monoclonal antibody which has revolutionized the treatment of psoriasis. And it should work in MS. Everything that we're learning from EAE is that IL-1223P40 is driving the disease. In fact, it's probably driving the development of TH17 cells, which are the, the main culprit now in what we believe is driving MS. So you give the patients ustekunumab. It's, it's the whole idea here is that these are going to uh, block the expansion of those TH17 cells. And unfortunately, there have been a couple of studies, but despite being well tolerated or reasonably well tolerated because in fact it's a known treatment for psoriasis, it failed to even reduce gadolinium enhancing lesions compared to placebo. And everything does that. That's a phase two trial. That's what everything goes through in order to see if it's going to be of use in a phase three study. No one has really been able to explain why it worked. It didn't work. Everything would say it would work, right? Maybe it has something to do with the timing. And you have to do it at a certain time when TH17 cells are really being driven. How do you know when that happens? We don't, of course. Maybe the population was too advanced. They went into progressive patients. We should have gone and used CIS patients or very early RMS patients. I'm not sure if there's any still uh, feeling that it should continue to be explored. But, you know, the data was there. And this is the, the data from the study. Um, and you can see that uh, there was nearly, this is the effect on, a, it should say gadolinium enhancing lesions to say that. Okay. So you can see the various dosing here. This is an increased dosing regimen. Really, you're not seeing anything here. This is the mean and this is the median, but you're really not seeing an effect at reducing GATO enhancing lesion. You would expect to see if this drug was effective, a dose response, and that the more you gave, the more you would have as an effect. Um, and there really wasn't an effect there on, on relapses either. Well, way back when, when the first sets of cytokines were being made and, and uh, developed a, a, a whole family of drugs, which blocked them, one of the target molecules that everyone pointed their finger at was tumor necrosis factor. And there was data suggesting that if you saw the soluble receptor in the CSF, these patients would have a terrible prognosis. That came out of the UK. Uh, I can't remember uh, the fellow who did that study, but the New England Journal, and everybody was concerned we had a biomarker. TNF has got to be bad. If you look at the mouse models chewing up the brain, tumor necrosis factor, we got to get rid of it. And in fact, it revolutionized the treatment of inflammatory bowel disease and rheumatoid arthritis. This is a mainstay therapy now for patients who have those conditions. So we know how destructive TNF is. It made absolute sense that we, with the, the, the stuff that's happened in SLE and inflammatory bowel disease and rheumatoid arthritis that goes into MS patients. And everybody didn't pay any attention to the rheumatological literature, but there were a number of patients in these early studies with infliximab who, who 
he started to develop all these white matter lesions. And the rheumatologists did a very bad job of following up those patients. They just said, well, that's a toxicity of uh, infliximab. And they threw them out of the studies. And long-term follow-up has been really lacking. There was an attempt to try to condense all this literature a few years ago by, I think, Denny Burdett out in Portland. And, and because there have been so many lawsuits now in patients who have been treated with TNF inhibitors with these conditions, only to turn around and have MS, and it looks like they were inducing these white matter lesions. And it wasn't just in the central nervous system. There was peripheral nervous system effects that also emerged. So there's something about the TNF inhibitors that was actually contributing to demyelination. But we ignored that because we didn't know about it. And instead, we looked at a molecule called Lenercept, which was a soluble TNF receptor linked to an immunoglobulin and was a wonderful drug at hoovering up or vacuuming up all the TNF that was around the body, including what we measured in the CSF. And we actually did repeat lumbar punctures on these patients, and the TNF went to zero. They could have had high levels of TNF, and the CNF went to zero. And guess what happened? Yeah, these patients did very poorly. In fact, the more you gave, the faster they relapsed. There was a dose-dependent increase in relapse rate and severity in the patients who received this. Interestingly, it's the first example where we saw a disconnect between the, the clinical attacks and the MRI. And in this particular study, despite this very clear increase in relapse rate, there was no change in the number of GATO-enhancing lesions over time in these patients. And then afterwards, the immunology literature started to come out with, well, TNF isn't so bad. There's really the two faces of TNF, and there's the good side, and then there's the bad side. And you know, you have to remember when you knock out old TNF, you were knocking out the good side. And the good side of TNF, what was it doing? It was actually killing bad lymphocytes, lymphocytes that were autoreactive or dependent on their death through TNF. And there was a whole slew of other things that TNF actually generates. It may actually be protective in some cases for the neurons. And, and so we learned our lesson. Just simply wiping out all the TNF probably wasn't the way to go. We uh, is Dimitri here? I didn't want to pick on poor Dimitri, but uh, he spent a lot of time developing linamide as a highly effective therapy. It was actually an amazing therapy at curing EAE, and uh, it was its effects were to reduce TNF and interferon gamma, which we believe drives the antigen-presenting cells and expression of MHC and a number of other things. That's the main target of interferon beta. It went into phase two RMS trials, and it looked like everything was going to be really good. But as soon as they went into phase three, something completely unexpected occurred, and all these toxicities arose. Finally, the safety committee had to shut this study down because of cardiac toxicity. I think there were a few MIs and even death. Uh, and uh, the notion was back to the drawing board, even though this was a, a, a wonderful looking drug from early studies and in uh, animals, uh, this was an unexpected toxicity. So they worked on this molecule for several years and liquinamide emerged very similar to linamide, but so supposedly without the cardiac toxicity. It's now it went through two large phase three studies in relapsing remitting, Allegro and Bravo, you know this data. And then now it's in a, a study of primary progressive patients. But they realized that the dose that they gave in RR might have been too low, so they went to a higher dose. And probably most of you know the story. Boom, cardiac toxicity is back. Uh, they had to eliminate the high-dose arm of that study, and the study has continued just with the low-dose arm. OK, let's move out of the cytokines and into the T cells. Maybe we can get at the heart of the disease by where these abnormal T cells are generated. 
I'm not I'm really not expecting to teach you immunology at this late stage, late time of day, but let me just um, pamper you with a little bit of a, a cartoon. So here's our antigen presenting cell, which could be microglia macrophages or dendritic cells. Here's our T cell with its T cell receptor. And here's our antigen. We don't know what the antigen is for multiple sclerosis, but how is this going to translate into this cell directing this cell? So this is kind of what happens. You have the, ant the antigen gets swallowed up by the APC, and then in the intracellular network, it gets hooked on to the MHC class two molecule and it presents itself to the T cell. That's not enough. That's the first signal. You need to have a strong uh, set of complementary adhesion molecules. And when these adhesion molecules are there, plus certain cytokines released, you get a turn on of your T cell. We know how all this happens. Is there a way of somehow interfering with this whole process and doing away with MS? And so some of these have been in the generation of the peptide that goes into there. And it turns out, I'm just going to back up for a second here, that what the nature of this peptide is directs the T cell. So as this is thought to be one of the mechanisms of how glutamoracetate works, because it gets itself in here, and when the T cell responds to glutamoracetate, what emerges from that is not a disease-causing autoreactive T cell. In fact, the cells that arise from that usually release cytokines, um, and, and these are protective cytokines. And maybe these cells even make it to the brain because GA has enough homology with a myelin protein that the cells can get in there. At least that's what the animals are telling us, right? And so if you can make a GA-like molecule that alters the T cell, but is a very strong binder, so it's, it's going to take all the autoreactive cells and expose it, then maybe you can change the personality of that T cell afterwards and change it from a bad guy to a good guy. And that is what altered peptide ligand therapies were presumably doing. So it made sense to create these and go into humans. And so there were two sets of these peptides developed and two studies, and actually they both got published back to back because of the unexpected findings that arose from that uh, and that the, the whole idea of the altered peptide was that you could take these cells that were partially activated and induce suppressive cells and then steer these autoreactive T cells away from affecting the brain. Well, the end result was not very good. And in both cases, even though in one of the studies there was even a, a slight hint that the drug was working, what was clear, though, was that it induced a whole set of, uh, of, of uh, new lesions in patients very dramatically on the MRI. In some of those patients, the, the MRI changed, but they weren't seen to have clinical relapses, but some of the cases did. This was, these were small studies, right? So the, the first was the MBP 8399, not the first time that MBP target was there. I'm not going to show you the results of the secondary progressive study that I was the first author on in secondary progressive MS targeting 8399 made no difference in those patients. Uh, and, and so that was the idea of a T cell vaccination. But this, this altered peptide ligand was really, really novel and cutting edge at the time it came out. Uh, dosages were terribly um, tolerated by patients who were many uh, almost allergic type reactions. And in one of the studies, the allergic type reactions was what stopped the altered peptide ligand standard, and that was the one of Larry Steinman's. So the, the, the second phase two study was a little bit larger, but was suspended due to those hypersensitivity reactions in some 9% of uh, uh, patients and, and uh, led to whole sorts of discussions of maybe we, we stimulated too much and we pushed everything to a TH2, which drove all these antibody reactions and created all the hypersensitivity. We did get rid of the cells, and they measured very carefully the T cells that emerged, and the altered peptide ligand definitely had the effect of reducing those T cells, but the end product of benefit to MS and or the unexpected toxicities were really what stopped the further development of altered peptide ligands. 
Okay, so I, I, if you remember that little drawing, just putting the little peptide in there isn't enough. You need those adhesion molecules that, that help to strengthen the bond with the T-cell receptor and the, and the presenting cell. What if we targeted the co-stimulatory molecules? That made sense. If you break the second signal, maybe those cells will never get turned on. And there have been a number of attempts to do so. Anti-CTLA-4 IG, which targets uh, one of the presenting molecules, CD8086, on the APCs. There was an early study that was folded. I was part of that. Uh, we never, that never saw the light of day. The company buried the data. Uh, basically, they had such a poor uh, uh, PI in there. There, there was a, an RA specialist who refused to listen to the MS guys, and they didn't balance the patients for an gato enhancing lesions. It turned out one of the doses had just a huge number of gadolinium enhancing lesions, which made the data uninterpretable. So my colleague, Samia Curry, really believed in this, and she said, this, this was wrong study. We should really try it again. So we, we got an NA, uh, NIH to sponsor this trial. It was a Batacept, and uh, we just published the data, actually, and it was completely negative. So uh, getting involved with the, uh, the, the co-stimulatory molecules made no difference in terms of the outcome of uh, MS. We, all, we also tried another one, the anti icam It was around the same time they were trying to use it in stroke to try to limit the damage that was occurred by stroke by preventing the cells from getting in through breaking those adhesion molecules. Uh, it was, we, we attempted to try to uh, reduce the dura duration of attacks, uh, but in both MS and stroke, there was really no benefit whatsoever. Then emerged the other important adhesion molecule, VLA-4 antagonist. And we've, we know about that because we have natalizumab, don't we? And natalizumab is very effective. But maybe we can come up with an oral trial that is a little bit better. And so that in came Feratagrass to try to get the same efficacy. And that study was stopped because although it worked, maybe the dosage wasn't high enough. Maybe they were afraid to go higher. The best they could do was a 49% reduction in GATO enhancing lesions. They figured if they can't at least match the efficacy of natalizumab, what's the point of further development? And that was shelved. Then anti CD40. So CD40 is another adhesion molecule or co stimulatory molecule, brings the T cell and the uh, presenting cells very close together. Uh, Torolizumab, they did a study of about 40 patients, looked good from the problem of uh, uh, EAE again. But when they went into Crohn's disease to try to do this, what happened was they developed, uh, I believe, not only thromboembolism, but they also got some hemolysis and hemolytic anemias that were not expected. And so when they saw that in Crohn's, they completely shelved the MS project, which was ongoing and recruiting, and you've never seen that study result because of this unexpected toxicity. Okay. We've heard about the B cell. Everybody wants to talk about B cells. I think somebody showed uh, an attacosep slide. It was you, I think you showed an attacosep slide. So B cells are bad, maybe. Targeting them has to be good, maybe. But where in their lineage should we be targeting them? So uh, a molecule was developed. This happened to be an interesting fusion protein, which targets B cells when they're just a little bit more mature. And that may be the problem because the end result of this study was that it removed what turned out to be what are probably B cell regulatory cells because they make IL-10 and IL-10 turns down the immune system. Nobody knew that at the time, but it seemed like a good idea. And uh, what they did is they targeted two molecules on the developing B cell something called B lice or B lymphocyte stimulator and something else called April. Listen, I don't come up with these terms. It's the immunologists who invent these lovely little things. April, a, a, a proliferating inducing ligand and that led actually to the stimulation of memory B cells and the memory B cells are thought to be the ones that are, are doing all the damage. So two studies emerged from this. The ATOM study, which is at Hecacept and MS, an attack except in optic neuritis. And so the MS trial, unfortunately, showed a dose-dependent increase in relapses, 
Where have we heard that before? And even in this case, an increased production of gadolinium-enhancing lesions. And although the studies were stopped, in optic neuritis, it actually had an effect of reducing conversion to MS in that particular uh, at-risk population of optic neuritis. So there was a lesson here. And when, when you think about the lineage of B cells, they grow at a certain stage before they become a plasma cell, and they express different molecules along here. And you've already heard from Olaf a little earlier about something that's targeting CD19, which comes just a little bit earlier than CD20. And then targeting the cells late, though, may be too late, because at this stage, you, you're, you're going to knock out the wrong cell type. But if you do them early, maybe you're going to knock out enough of the B cells that are stimulating the, the memory. And so that's where the attacacept came in here. This is the fusion protein where they took the tacky molecule, which is right here, and they went after tacky is embedded in the membrane. Here's April and then B list together. They put it on here and made a fusion protein. And it should have mopped up the B cells. Uh, and you can see where tacky would be evolving somewhere in the lineage here just before the development plasma blasts, whereas an anti-CD19 and anti-CD20 are going to target B cells in their development much earlier. So right idea, but too late in the stage of the development of the particular cell. And the ATOM study here is showing here there were four different doses, sorry, three different doses versus the placebo. And then the patients went into the follow-up. Uh, and uh, this was published. And you can see here a nice Here's the higher dosing. So the more you gave, the more attacks they had. Pretty clear. We have found another way to make MS worse. OK, what about S1P receptor agonists? So they work, don't they? So the whole thought about the S1P receptor agonists is that these S1P receptors are on many cells. But when they are located on neuronal cells, everything from the in vitro work and the animal work strongly suggested that tickling an S1P receptor agonist will lead to good things. It causes oligodendrocytes to sprout and look happy. It, it, it uh, is neuroprotective. It, the cells last longer in such paradigms. Maybe it might even work in stroke. I think maybe it's been tested in stroke. I, I, I don't recall if it has or is not. But in MS, the whole idea was that the receptor on the surface of the lymphocyte allowed that modulator to uh, lead to sequestration of the cell in the lymph node because the cells can get in. But in order to get out, they need the expression of S1P on the surface. And so they'll get into the lymph node and not get out. And they're stuck there until they re-express their S1P receptor agonist. But if it also, because it can get into the brain, maybe it's also going to stimulate neural protection or maybe even neural recovery. A dual mode, perfect drug. It works outside and inside. And the animal work did suggest it got inside. This is an autoregraphic image of a mouse with lighting up the spinal cord in the brain because this is an autoradiogram with labeled fingolimod. So it, we know it can get into the brain. And when it gets in there, it does all sorts of good things, right? It, it, it turns down astrocytes. In some cases, it can make good astrocytes. So the effects seem to be good. It enhances survival of the oligodendrocyte through its interactions. It even makes neurons happy. Um, it's a happy drug. It gets in and does all these wonderful things. Does it work in reality? The animal models would suggest it does. The signaling is there. But we had to put it to the test. And so, of course, many of you know about this. This was all tested in primary progressive multiple sclerosis, the Fingolimod study. Here's a, here's a patient group with an unmet need has an advancing disease. If anybody was in need of neuroprotection and recovery, it's the PPMS patients because the anti-inflammatory effect, as you heard from the last talk, is going to have is going to be very unlikely 
to have any benefit in these patients, right? And so here's the end result, and it was a composite endpoint. We really gave these patients every opportunity to get better. The composite endpoint was the uh, time 25 foot walk plus the EDSS, and it was double blind, and there was really absolutely no difference or in the EDSS, right? No difference. But surely the EDSS and the MSFC are insensitive. We heard earlier about confirmed disability improvement and a debate on whether that was going to be useful. Maybe we're just not using the right measure. And if the effect is there inside the brain, it's got to be it's going to be interpreted through an MR metric. And the most sensitive metric is going to be atrophy. So surely there's going to be an effect on reduced brain atrophy because we know that this drug does this in relapsing remitting MS. And if it does it by getting into the brain and having an effect internally, surely that effect will still be evident in the primary progressive patients. And that's what this is right here. And so the difference is not statistically significant at all. So the, there's no translation of all that wonderful thought process of the S1P receptor agonist, despite what it did in the animals. We did not see any benefit whatsoever in the group. And we've turned this data upside down and backwards looking for a signal, and none is present. Oh, it did turn down a few enhancing lesions in the patients who did have some, and it did turn down um, a few relapses, but there were so few in the group. Well, I could probably go on and on, but I'm not going to because it's late in the day. Many good, good trials based on the rationale developed through animal models. These were models of unnatural inflammation. MS is a human disease. It does not occur in animals naturally. We create central nervous system inflammation in a very artificial way, and we try to learn from those models something that might resemble what the inflammation is in humans and glean from that ideas to go after treatments. The immunology of MS is very complex. There are many different cells and, and molecules that are involved. And the idea of targeting just one of those, remember that slide I showed earlier, is pretty unlikely to make a big difference in the scheme of things. And especially when you think about the complexity of immunology, even in a single patient that may change over time, it's also hard to imagine that that one treatment is going to be beneficial for life. We have learned from trials that have given us some unsuspected outcomes. It teaches us to go back to the drawing board. Maybe our hypotheses are wrong, or maybe they're partially right. But we need to be able to do these experiments in humans because you're not going to get the answer um, from all the animal models. You're going to get ideas. And then I'll leave you with my final slide. Like I said, if MS was EAE, we'd probably be able to cure it. Maybe one day the patient will come in looking like this. Thank you very much for your attention this late in the day. Happy to entertain comments or questions. Just one question. I, I feel I have to speak up on behalf of the T cell enthusiasts in the room. Uh, the trials you mentioned on CD4 monoclonal antibodies that were conducted in the mid 1990s, I think that has to be put into historical context because. That was during the height of the AIDS epidemic, and the regulatory agencies actually required to cease dosing when you know C4 T cell numbers went below 250, and that's actually so. Actually, there was no T cell depletion in those trials, and the numbers in those trials of T cells were much higher than what we see today with fingolimod or dimethylfumarate. And despite that, the annual relapse rate was actually significantly lower than the placebo trial and better than at the time Compaxon and Splendida. So I think just based on those trials, I would not count out CD4 T cells as they, I don't think anybody's going to go back there. Right. I, I, I was going to ask that because yeah. they also, I think if I recall, Howard Weiner and David uh, Haffler showed that they could actually see the 
OKG4 in the brain, they were able to pull it out of spinal fluid. So it probably influenced the cells right behind the blood brain barrier. But we've never gone back there. You're absolutely right. I guess everybody's just tired, so it's a good day. being relevant but uh, not in isolation and one you gave one very relevant example with sphingolimod sphingolimod is a very good drug for uh, its immunological effect so maybe and but it it could have had a dual mode but it didn't i'm sorry uh, that? it could have had also a neuroprotective effect but that didn't turn off but do you think that the way forward despite all of these problems, may be to find one of these drugs that would have both an immunomodulatory effect and a neuroprotective effect at the same time. I thought you were going somewhere else with that, Chris. But sure, it would be wonderful to find a drug that had that. But I thought where you were going with this is, wouldn't it make sense to take a drug that does one thing that kind of works and another drug that does something else that kind of works and put them together? Yeah and see if we can get something that really works without getting any enhanced toxicity. Combination therapy is the way we've treated AIDS effectively today. Why aren't we doing this in MS? There's one reason, right there. And as soon as these drugs come down in cost, we're going to be able to start doing some of these trials and putting some drugs together and seeing, I think, substantial benefit. And, and, and we're just waiting for the opportunity to do that. Brian? Um, thank you, Mark. That was uh, a fantastic talk, a nice uh, trip, especially for me back down memory lane. Uh, CD3 certainly was a failure. I remember sitting with each of those patients at their bedside as they were getting it. I think at that time we didn't know how to treat cytokine storm. And the first few patients did not get pretreatment with steroids learned that that was helpful, so a lot of lessons, and actually that was the first trial of a monoclonal antibody in MS patients, and I suppose it ushered in, uh, to some extent, uh, an era. What, one um, thing that you didn't discuss, I think you were otherwise really comprehensive, was a trial of interferon gamma, and arguably that was one that we learned probably the most about uh, MS immunology, but interferon gamma was administered to patients, which was also a devastating failure. Thank you. I, 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 I did that because Hillel Panich, all of a shalom, is long gone from us, and he had the right idea uh, at the time. We didn't know about two different interferons. It was based on the idea that NK cells were deficient in, in MS patients, uh, and, and so interferon was a big inducer of NK cells, and maybe if we got those NK cells to, to proliferate, their disease would get better. Was, uh, that was the re immunological rationale at the time. Who knew that that was wrong? And it turns out it was the wrong interferon. But uh, they, they soon discovered that there were two types of interferons, and of course type 1s are now mainstay therapies. But So Hill had the right thought. I was close to the right molecule, but it was based on, on the understanding at the time. We learned from our mistakes. We learned a lot from that trial, uh, Brian, that was, you know, that here's a cytokine that we had anticipated. And in EAE, it made it better, right? Because you can make interferon gamma make EAE better. It depends on when you give it. That model will show anything you want, depending on how you manipulate it. So it was, uh, I think it was sound rationale. I don't want to blame them for, for uh, making patients worse, but we, we've done a few studies like that. But you're absolutely right. That was the first one that I think opened our eyes. Thank you, Mark, and uh, 